Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship for Sunday, June 2nd. It's the second Sunday after Pentecost. And so begins the long green season. The green pyramids you see behind me will grace the pulpit and the altar until October, Reformation Sunday. At this point in our church life, we generally start to slow down. But this year, as we crawl out of a year of seclusion, Holy Trinity is getting some new energy. We are beginning in-person worship this week for those of you who are comfortable meeting in person. It's Grad Sunday, and we will celebrate Joey as he graduates from Mercer Island High School and moves on to the University of Washington. We will wrap him up in the love of this congregation and bless his new adventures. We are planning a week of service and a church barbecue at the end of July. We can go to the ballpark together in August. After a year of staying apart, we're starting to come together. Today, whether you're watching this from home or joining us in the sanctuary, we will hear the same word of God. We will sing the same songs of faith and the same words will be heard from Pastor Sue. Listen, God is calling. Hi kids. I'm wondering if you planted some flower seeds or vegetable seeds this spring. I went to Miss Kathy's Earth Day uh, Sunday, it was probably about a month and a half ago now, 
and we planted some little trees that looked like sticks and she gave us some seeds for uh, lettuce or tomatoes and let me show you how they're doing so far. Well the lettuce is just beginning to look like it might turn into a lettuce plant and here are the little tomato plants those have got a long way to go and here's the little tree that only looked like a stick is starting to look like a baby tree now. Well, I don't know about you, but I get kind of impatient waiting for things to grow. So I thought I would show you something you can grow in just a few days. This is something called mung beans, and you can make bean sprouts with this. You can buy these at any Asian food store. They cost maybe a dollar and a half or two for a bag like this. A little bit more if you want the organic kind. I am going to uh, open my bag up. That's the hardest part. And because I'm just one person, I'm just going to put a couple of tablespoons of beans into a strainer like this. And then I'm going to put that over a bowl to catch the water. And then I am just going to rinse that over like that. And now I'm going to soak. The, they look like this. I'm going to put the beans to soak in this little bowl of water right here, like that. And then I'm going to put these not in the refrigerator, not in the sun, but in maybe in a cupboard or any um, dark place. You could cover that over with a cheesecloth or just anything so it gets a little bit of circulation. Well, it's uh, been about 12 hours or a little bit more since I started draining my beans. And let's see what happened. I picked out about four of the beans that looked like they weren't doing anything. Remember, this is the, the size that we started out our mung beans. They were sitting overnight um, in a dark place. And these are some of the beans that have been soaking. And see how much bigger they are now? I'm just going to throw these little ones away because these are not going to do anything. But I have soaked my beans beans overnight. Now I have drained them and now I'm going to rinse them off again. And now I'm going to take a jar. This is a peanut butter jar and it's not a very big one because like I say I'm only making enough for one person. And you can either cover it with a cheesecloth that's held in place with a rubber band or I like to just take a hammer and nail and punch a bunch of holes in the lid of my peanut butter jar. And then I'm going to put the beans into the jar and it should be not more than about a quarter of the way full. In fact, a quarter, a quarter full is probably a great plenty. You're not, going to, you're not going to soak them again in water, but you'll put the, the beans wet into the peanut butter jar and again put it for about 12 hours in a dark place. And when you look at it again in 12 hours, you may find that the, the bean has burst open and you can see the white part inside. Put them back in the cupboard for another 12 hours, um, chain, rinse them off every 12 hours, and gradually it'll start to grow a little tail. And then soon you will have a lot of bean sprouts like that. The only thing about this kind that you sprout at home is that often they've got a little green hull on them. And they won't hurt you any if you want to eat that, but some people like to pick that off. That's the little shell that the, that the, the bean was in. It reminds me of when Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, unless a seed is planted, it's just a seed. But if it's planted in the ground, uh, or in our case, in a peanut butter jar, the seed, in a way, it dies, but you get something new out of it. And of course, he was talking about himself, that his body was going to die but he would rise up again um, and be greater than ever. Well, what do you do with, um, with all these bean sprouts? Well, one thing you can do is put them in an Asian stir fry. I like to just plunge them into hot water for a few seconds. They will quickly cool off. And then it can be like a little freestanding salad. You could put, um, you could experiment with some Asian salad dressings or just any kind of oil and vinegar dressing would be good. Anyway, happy sprouting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. 
all-powerful God, in Jesus Christ, you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the third chapter of Genesis. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning is from the second, second Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake so that grace as it extends to more and more people may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but what it cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let's sing the gospel acclamation. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the third chapter, beginning with the 20th verse. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went to, out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called to them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If, an, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end is come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. And then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. 
The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you in peace. For the past few weeks, we've been filling out surveys, haven't we, to paint a picture of our congregation and what we're looking for in a lead pastor. And the transition team has been busy putting all of that together for us. And the bishop's office will then go to work matching us with the same kind of paperwork from prospective pastors. And once the ball got rolling, our transition team has really been moving along at a good clip. Some interesting themes have emerged from our surveys. We are a congregation that likes to do things. We like to share our time, talent, and treasure with neighbors in need. People have spoken fondly of the era of going down to El, uh, El Salvador, to El Milagro, primarily because of the friendships forged with the people in that village and the friendships between uh, the members who went on the trips, and they were people of all ages. Every year, Kathy has organized a major trip for youth, sometimes to ELCA youth gatherings, but a lot, a lot of trips to do um, Hurricane Katrina relief work or flood relief in Colorado, uh, whale watching and ecological studies. And we tend to be more focused on contemporary issues than Bible study and doctrine. Many of you are involved with school issues, immigration, gun safety, hunger, Black Lives Matter. I met Victoria Park, actually, when she was no more than five years old, maybe younger than that, helping to serve dinner at one of the Compass Center shelters. And she went on to take the microphone at the Senate Assembly when she was an eighth grader. On the other hand, it's hard to find a time when people are willing and able to commit to a Bible study. I thought of that not long ago when uh, one of the women at Mary's place, she participated in our Holy Trinity uh, Epiphany service. She's usually the lector um, when I preach at, at Mary's place, I was talking to her. She cannot attend the Bible study at Church of Mary Magdalene, but she would like to zoom in to another Bible study somewhere. Well, we don't have one. We have many, made many brave attempts, but it never seems to last very long. At the same time, our congregation has a strong sense of Lutheran identity. And when we worship, we want to feel like we're in a Lutheran church. Now, whenever you, you fill out a survey like that, that asks you to rank the things that you think are important, you aren't exactly saying that the things that you didn't check are not important, but you only have three choices or five choices. Or when you have to place yourself somewhere on the spectrum, you can only choose one point. The observations that we made about ourselves sent me to thinking, just what is a Lutheran identity? So indulge me in a few flashbacks on my own journey. What does it mean to have a Lutheran identity? Well, I remember when the Lutheran seminary professor started the, the discussion about piety. What does piety mean? You know, it's, it's one of those words that in kind of a, a squishy, kind of sort of way, you know what it means, but you can't really define it. And just at the sound of the word, people were throwing out ideas like uptight and judgmental. But actually, the way that we were using it in that class, it was more like your way of doing your faith. The feelings, the associations, the traditions, the flavor, the way of expressing yourself, the things that you choose to do to, to act out your, your faith in, as you in your time, in your culture. Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary was established because the West Coast mentality and the West Coast uh, piety was different from the East or the Midwest. And that course, it was called Lutheran, uh, American Lutheranism. And American Lutheranism has a little different piety than, than that in the mother countries. We had to read a book called Giants in the Earth. And it was about a first generation Norwegian family in about the era of Little House on the Prairie. Now, I could not relate at all to the part about the itinerant pastor who came to visit every year because that side of my family was emphatically not churchgoers. But it happened that I read that book when I was at home. I was in this very room. I had flown back home on the news that my dad had died. It was not unexpected. We weren't very close, but it was a transition for our family. And as I read Giants in the Earth, 
I was bookmarking significant pages, and I realized I was marking nearly every page because it could have been about my family dressed up in period costumes. And I thought, oh, that's, th that's why we are the way that we are. Even though we didn't speak the language, we didn't keep any of the customs, there was just a way of being, a way of expressing or not expressing yourself. That is one reason that people find their way to a church with a piety that feels right. We're unconsciously carrying family traits that have been passed down over generations. And you might enjoy visiting a church that's a little more boisterous or more academic on a Sunday morning, but maybe you find that you've settled on one that meets your needs as a steady diet. Even when I went to the office of that particular professor to say that I might have to make an emergency trip home, and this was a guy who had found his teaching in calling, uh, or in his calling in teaching, uh, and not in pastoral work. I thought he was so wonderfully uneffusive, because bear hugging and back stroking and emoting was the last thing that I would have wanted. He expressed some sympathy and concern, and then he said, "What did you think about my comments on that article?" <laughs> I don't think any Lutheran pastor would have come up with saying that, but you know, uh, at that moment in time, piety-wise, that was just fine for me. That is a part of Lutheran identity, just the sense that it fits culturally. And if you were part of the very large Lutheran community on the continent of Africa, your Lutheran piety would probably feel different. But this sets us on a collision course with our efforts to not be a little German and Scandinavian enclave. It's just all about what feels right to us. Another more important part of Lutheran tradition is Luther's principles by scripture alone, by grace alone, by faith alone, through Christ alone, glory to God alone. And if you came through another Protestant tradition, your forebears probably said something like that. Well, one of Luther's missions in life 500 years ago was to check what the church was teaching and get rid of anything that didn't square with the Bible. And in those days, there was a lot. Another mission in his life was to place a readable Bible in the hands of any Christian. His life happily coincided with the printing press. Before that, it was easy to, for people to just be told whatever the church handed down. And since God has chosen to reveal God's self in Scripture, not as the only way, but in a major way, we believe it's important for people to know what it says and interact with it. As seminary curricula are being revised right now, the, the trend is to let go of required courses in Biblical Greek or Hebrew. A four-year graduate program just isn't workable for some people, and the, the young people are still paying for college. Um, career changers likely have a spouse and children to consider. Not that many, that, many, that many people anyway will will keep up with Greek or Hebrew after they take that final exam. So they have to figure out what is what can they drop. What we lose, though, is that person or two who sees the text in its original language and thinks, Oh, maybe what I've been taught is kind of glossing over this particular point. And they catch the academic bug to dig deeper. And we need people to read those ancient texts with fresh eyes in the light of those contemporary texts that are so important to us. Otherwise, women, LGBT folks, people of color, immigrants, people with interfaith families, survivors of violence, all the communities that they represent have to be happy with what the theologians from Northern Europe were teaching years and years ago. And it's not that, that those, there usually were men or were bad people, they simply were not gonna have the, the same questions that modern people from more diverse backgrounds are gonna have. Well, one book that I did not have to buy when I started seminary was a Greek New Testament. I got it when I was still living in Japan. It was the 1980s and the church was lagging behind as the English language had been changing rapidly for 15 years. And I wanted to know when the English in the Bible said men, 
if it really said men or if it said people? Well, you say, well, who, who would care about that? Well, it was the 80s, and the sexism in many branches of the church would glom on to male-dominated language like that. And gender inequality was one of the reasons that a lot of people in my generation dropped out of the church. Uh, in the office where we worked on Friday afternoons while the boss could be, we could count on him being out on one of his four to five hour lunches. We had lots of time to chat. And I was surrounded by church dropouts. There was the man who was frustrated by racism in Georgia, where he came from. There was a survivor of a, a Catholic boarding school. There were gay people. There were all kinds of people. And they had all kinds of wrong notions about what the Bible taught and what it didn't. And I knew they were wrong, but I needed to know more. I couldn't re read the Greek. Still can't without a, a stack of dictionaries. But at least I could find verses and decipher which word was used. Did it say man or did it say person? I wanted to see for myself. And you know, that was actually very Lutheran of me, even though I, I wouldn't have probably thought of that. Um, after a terrible conflict in this congregation, right smack in the middle of my high school and college years, I had just about sworn off the Lutheran church. Well, seminary for me uh, started at Fuller in Seattle because I was one of those people with a family situation that I, I couldn't just move to um, Minnesota or California. And I surprised myself by liking Fuller. It was where the Seattle people would go uh, before Seattle University started its seminary program. And I hung out with the Presbyterians. But oh my, some of the people there were like um, walking chain reference Bibles. It was a little intimidating, even though I had spent the summer doing a straight read through the Old Testament because our lectionary schedule of, of readings gives us you know little snippets of the Old Testament tied to the, the gospel readings, but we don't get the stretches of Old Testament narrative. And so I didn't really know where David or Daniel fit in or, or who the prophets were talking to or about. On the other hand, I was surprised at how much trouble some of the folks from uh, the, the non-denominational backgrounds had um, with some ideas like, begotten versus created, or Christ being of one substance with the Creator. I had more background in doctrine. You know, we hear a word like doctrine, and what, what does it call to mind? A long, boring lecture, totally out of touch. Actually, I had not learned any of these concepts from lectures, but I had the experience of living with the Nicene Creed for weeks at a time when I was in high school because we had to work through arrangements of two different folk services. And I would be poring over these things thinking, well, that's a G chord, wonder what those words mean. It may sound abstract and useless, like contemplating angels dancing on the head of a pin. Why can't we just serve our neighbor? But you know, strange cults often start from people not having thought about these things that are found in creeds and going off on weird tangents. Like, Jesus was just a teacher. Jesus was purely spirit. He didn't die. Sickness and death aren't real. You, too, can attain perfection. America is the new holy land. War in Jerusalem is God's plan for the return of Christ. Don't bother tending the, the garden of creation because the world is ending soon. And all of these are real beliefs in this country, and some of them, in fact, even influence our politics. If you don't like the stuff you hear on TV from TV from the, from the preachers, if you don't like nationalism or bigotry hitching a ride on Christianity, if the, the preachers embarrass you that the, reader, the reporters will go to for commentary after some outrageous thing has happened, if you don't like any of that stuff, then be thankful for doctrine. It may be the reason that you find your way to the Lutheran Church. Doctrine I'm talking about in the sense of putting order to our belief, testing it for blind alleys and pitfalls. And the forebears of any of the mainline denominations have thought through the various heresies and hypocrisies that keep cycling through the world, cycling through the church. As people of their time, they wouldn't have asked themselves the same questions. 
but they have given us guardrails against going down a lot of the wrong paths. Well, what does this have to do with our text today? I think a common thread that we find in Genesis and Mark uh, is in our passages for today is this human capacity to be led along. We know how Adam and Eve came to be running away from God. God told them, don't eat the fruit from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You will surely die. And Satan says to every man and every woman, you won't die. You should eat it. You'll be just like God. And they say, oh, okay. Jesus deals with his family, led along to believe that he's crazy, even though they've known him for 30 years. And the religious leaders who have no idea how evil works. If Jesus has done away with something evil, well, they think maybe he was calling on evil spirits to do that. No, evil doesn't, doesn't fight evil. Evil attracts evil. And I'm pretty sure the religious leaders were not calling on Jewish doctrine. They were led along maybe by some of the magic cults that were going around in that day. They did not get it from the synagogue. And Jesus says, think what it would be like if you were trying to break into the enemy's house and plunder it, to take back the things that aren't his. You can't do it any way except binding him up. Bind up the big Satan. And this is a paraphrase of an Old Testament concept that those religious leaders knew or should have known from the book of Isaiah. Can you take away a soldier's loot? Can you rescue the prisoners of a tyrant? The Lord replies that that is exactly what is going to happen. The soldier's prisoners will be taken away and the tyrant's loot will be seized. I will fight against whoever fights you and I will rescue your children. Not Beelzebul, not Satan, of course not Satan. God is the rescuer. If we were uh, in Mark, if we were to, to back up one paragraph in Mark 3 to verse 13, we would find parts of um, one of the parts of Mark that gets skipped over in our lectionary because it isn't very interesting, and that is the list of the 12 disciples. It says, He went up the mountain and called to those whom he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 whom he also named to be apostles. Well, something that we don't notice when we're reading in snippets, as we do, actually, we've already had the story of the calling of some of the disciples, the calling of the four fishermen, James and John and Peter and Andrew. We've had already the call of Levi, the tax collector. I suspect that Mark lists the 12 at this particular spot to lead us into the next story, the one that we had. We notice they're not just called disciples, they're apostles. They're people who were sent out on his behalf to proclaim the message and to have authority to cast out demons. And if you count yourself as a disciple, put yourself into that list and read on. Proclaim the, the message and cast out demons. In other words, confront evil. For example, go to the big Satan and launch an assault. Bind the strong man. You who are my hands and feet and voice. And arm yourself with what you need, the power of the word of God and the discipline of some thoughtful study. You know, eight or so years ago when Holy Trinity had our reconciling in Christ conversation, there was a strong conviction that this was the step that we wanted to take. But if we were confronted by, um, by sincere people wanting to do the right thing, who pointed out to us the infamous Bible bullets used against the full equality of gays in the church, I'm not sure that we would have had a solid core of people who would have been able to have that conversation, verse for verse, which is what those folks would have expected, and they had a right to ask. That is one of those contemporary issues that are important to us. You know, during the years with the Compass Center, when I visited so many congregations to preach, I used to look forward to going to some of the most dynamic churches, the ones that supported us with meals and financial gifts and youth who would go out on the street with us. But between the services, not that many people would come to my presentation. They were all over at the competition. It was the Bible class. It's very gratifying to know that we see ourselves as a church that does things, doesn't only talk. There is a saying that you don't want to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. 
At the same time, let's be as robust and dynamic as we can be by doing both and. Lutheran in our hymns and traditions and care for our neighbor, and also in the pillars of the Reformation, by scripture alone, by grace alone, by faith alone, through Christ alone, glory to God alone. Amen. come together before the triune God in prayer. God of wholeness, we pray for believers all over the world. Unify us in service of the gospel, that we may work together as beloved siblings to share your love with all. God of the cosmos, we pray for creation, the gardens, waterways, and creatures near to us and diverse forms of life that remain unseen. Teach us to treat the natural world with reverence, seeking restoration when human divisions have caused harm to your beloved creation. God of all people, we pray for harmony among the nations and for those who are oppressed or in any need, especially in Israel, Belarus, India, and the United States. Cast out from us unclean spirits of greed and fear that we could work in solidarity with one another for the common good. God of righteousness, we pray for our holy house of worship. Set our gaze upon things eternal and guide us into the coming year so that we would extend grace to more and more people. We pray for those whose lives are closely linked with ours for health and serenity. We remember before you especially John, Loretta, David, Mona, Joanne, Dorothy, Sandy, Kathy, and Cannon. As the church honors Chief Seattle tomorrow, we know that we live on the unceded land of his people, the Duwamish. Help us to embrace his conviction for peace and his life of prayer. Now, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us pray now using the words that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Now go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.